So we have today two authors discussing their uh, recent PLOS One lab protocol article entitled In Vitro Assembly of Plasmid DNA for Direct Cloning in Lacti Planti Bacillus Plantarum WCSF1. And the associated protocol posted in protocol.io. So I'm very pleased to have Dr. Sri Krishnan Sankaran, who is a research group leader at the Leibniz Institute for New Materials in Germany, and his PhD student, Mark Blanca Sensio. So Dr. Sankaran, heads the bioprogrammable materials group that explores a young multidisciplinary field combining synthetic biology and biomaterials. This group focuses on development of materials with genetically programmed functionalities capable of biosensing, stimuli responsive, long-term drug release, and manipulation of cell behavior. Shirish, did his PhD at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, where he combined protein and bacterial engineering with supramolecular chemistry to create dynamic and stimuli responsive biointerfaces. He followed this up with postdoctoral training at the Leibniz Institute for New Materials, where he integrated engineered bacteria with hydrogels to create light responsive living drug delivering construct. He established his independent junior research group in 2020, focusing on the engineering of probiotic bacteria with therapeutic capability. Mark, as I mentioned before, is a PhD student at the Bioprogrammable Materials Group at the Leibniz Institute for New Materials in Germany. Mark received his bachelor's in microbiology from the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain and completed his master's in molecular genetics at Leiden University in the Netherlands, focusing on bacterial genetic engineering. In 2021, he moved to Germany to pursue a PhD in synthetic biology. Currently, Mark is in his third year and working on expanding the genetic toolbox of non-model probiotic bacteria and genetically programming them with versatile functionalities, ranging from therapeutic protein secretion to gene expression induction. Shirish and Mark, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks a lot, yeah. <laughs> to begin with the interview, can you briefly explain to us what uh, the protocol is about, how to use it, and why it is relevant? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we started engineering lactobacillus. We got into um, the, this field a bit naively. Um, we were engineering E. coli a lot. And um, then we yeah we thought okay we do the same thing with lactobacilli they're nice probiotic bacteria they're very applicable for therapeutics and uh, yeah we immediately met a roadblock basically in just getting the DNA inside um, we faced problems like uh, you know the, the the either the plasmid DNA doesn't go in or it gets mutated um, or we have very poor transformation efficiencies all of these things were a problem so actually. Yeah, Mark and, and the other co-author on the paper, Shaurik, um, sort of, uh, yeah, worked together, tried out many different things and came up with this direct cloning protocol to solve this problem. Um, and I, I can give you a few details if if that if you think that's relevant now. Yes, um, I think it will be interesting to know why, what was the state of the art and why previously mm -hmm. published protocols for let's say more regular bacteria didn't work for you and what were the modifications that you optimized to have it work in um in lactobacillum 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the state of the art is usually that you need an intermediate host. So you, you prepare your DNA in a certain way, you use Gibson assembly or uh, restriction digestion, ligation, whatever you want, and then you get a bit of plasmid. You take that plasmid, put it into E. coli, and then you expand the amount of plasmid you have extracted from E. coli, and then put that into a lactobacillus related strain which is fine. Uh, previous reports already suggested that, okay, uh, you know, there are problems with this approach. Some people use lactococcus lactis. Uh, in any case, this requires you to have, you know, multiple origins of replication. Things have to be compatible with the intermediate host. Um, and then it takes longer, basically the whole process. And what we realized is all we need the intermediate host for is to get more plasmid. Because once you do this kind of uh, assembly with Gibson assembly or, or restriction digestion, whatever you do, you you get very little amount of plasmid out of that. So all these DNA parts have to assemble. They all, they're all done at low concentration. And you get a small proportion of that that's actually assembled. E. coli and, and lactis are great in picking up DNA and then working with them. But lactobacillus with its super thick cell wall um is is a bit of a nightmare that way <laughs> so it's it's not easy to get it in but we have such good technology right now with uh, engineering genes and engineering dna uh, we have really good polymerases and so on so what we thought is let's just amplify the whole um the, the whole plasmid with pcr because that's that's completely possible these days and so that's that's basically what Mark uh, went into doing. He he got whatever we assembled. He got the primers that would just amplify the whole DNA. Uh, and then the, you have really nice kits to phosphorylate the backbone, stitch it together, basically recircularize it. And then we could see that, yeah, we get like the one microgram of DNA or whatever that you need to then get it into, into lactobacillus. Lactiplantiblastulus plantarum is, is the one we worked with. Uh, and yeah, so it worked really nicely. It was something uh, that we felt was quite new for the community. Uh, it uses pretty modern genetic engineering techniques because there are some people who have published something along these lines in the past, uh, but we updated that much more and, and showed uh, certain new capacities with it. So, so yeah, that's kind of the... the... Yeah, yeah, sorry, please go ahead. No, no, I was going to say that you went through all this trouble of having a protocol that would work for you, but then you took the next step and you make the protocol public. So what was the motivation for you to share first in the platform and then much more formally have it peer reviewed as a standalone methodological paper in PLOS One? Can you elaborate and share with us what were your motivations? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I have to give the credit to Mark for that, largely, who drove this aspect of, of getting it uh, published in, in Plus One and, and putting it up in Protocols.io and so on. Um, I Well, from my perspective, uh, when he convinced me to do this, because I thought, okay, it's a protocol in our lab, works well, it's fine, you know, let's do the real science now. Um, but he actually convinced me that there is actually a lot of science in developing that protocol already. He did a lot of optimization. There are things that are non-trivial and the field is pretty small in terms of lactobacillus engineering, but all the potential exists. So people always talk about engineering these bacteria for therapeutics, engineering them for certain food-based uh, research, engineering them to understand probiotics better, uh, but everyone's kind of stuck in this kind of a step. And and so, yeah, that that. that he he talked me into it a little bit, and then I once I looked into it in a bit deeper, yeah, I thought, yeah, it has to be out there. People have to see it, and the motivation to get it properly peer-reviewed, because we could have put out the protocol, we could have put it out in archive, um, but the point was to see what does the community think out there. We wanted experts to see it. Uh, we we really like PLOS One's model of, of doing this, keeping everything as open as possible. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we went ahead with that. And I mean, I don't know if Mark, yeah, you have something to add to that also for like the, the burning motivation that you came to me with. At the beginning, it was just one idea that I thought and it became super useful, it was working. And then it worked for one cloning, then for the other, for the other, we kept like um, cloning more stuff, not only me, my colleague as well. 
So we saw it's uh, fully reproducible. And then, yeah, we, of course, it like it involved more work to like uh, make a paper out of it, not only a protocol. But, you know, first year PhD, I was motivated. Uh, so yeah, we gave it a try and it worked out super well. It was also good to see how reviewers would receive this. And it was very positive to be involved in these kind of um, revisions. And then also in conferences, we've been like talking to people about this protocol and it receives uh, always a very nice feedback. Uh, some people that they are also experiencing mutations, for instance, instead of using the more uh, standard cloning strains, they buy expensive thermostable E. coli strains that they are very expensive and so on. This works, but yeah, maybe each vial is 50 euros, you know, so, um, well, uh, I hope that uh, now they're aware of these and they give it a try and, and it's pretty straightforward, actually. So once you're familiar, um, it's very useful. Now we, everyone in the lab uses this um, protocol to like uh, clone stuff in, in lactobacillus. That's great. And I have to say about the value of methodological developments. Uh, our founder is actually a geneticist and he spent, he has academic training and he did a PhD, uh, postdoc at MIT and he spent a year and a half trying to implement single cell microscopy in yeast. And there was a protocol already published, but he worked a year and a half in just tweaking one step. And as you said, you know that information is usually lost. Uh, or people say in materials and methods, oh, we did this as previously reported with minor modifications, and yeah. you never know what those minor modifications are, nor you know how much time and science uh, and non-trivial research uh, goes into optimizing a protocol. So I'm very happy to hear that you saw value, that you, uh, and, and the decision to give credit to your own effort into having a protocol mm -hmm. that is optimized and that is working. Also at the beginning, this was part of another paper and we just put it there as a big paragraph in the methodology. And then after yeah. reading, it was like, this is getting a bit confusing, too much information there is stuck, you know? So uh, we decided to make a paper out of it, explaining properly, then write the protocols in protocols.io and and now it's way more clear, yeah. And then we had, we could, sim thanks to this paper, we could simplify the other paragraph in methodology because this is described in this paper. Yes, so, exactly. And people have access to the step by step, the temperatures, and yeah. like everything, right? It's not just a vague general description of a paragraph, but you have the very clear workflow yeah. of the protocol. And I think in this Absolutely. protocol, I have some comments um, uh, concerning my experience with some of the steps. I remember I added some stuff like this, and this in a paper, you cannot do it. Mm. And elaborating on that, can you share a little bit? Uh, how the feedback that you got from the reviewers shaped the final version of your protocol? I have to say the feedback was was actually really good. So um, of course it's it's a methodological paper and people take it for that value. So it's not about oh is this the most novel thing or not? Um, but they they did take the time and effort I think to to look into the value of it as a methodology. Um, what I can say is I think it went to good reviewers. Uh, from what I remember, we got pretty good comments that strengthened the, the, the quality of the overall study and the overall protocol that we developed eventually. We, uh, Mark, if you, if you remember a bit more details about it, maybe you can also say something. I remember uh, one comment of one reviewer concerning the risk of getting the backbone in the final a mixture of DNA. So like once we we um, use, for instance, vector as template for PCR, we PCR this, then we do, we have the parts there, we assemble all together, like with Gibson assembly. And then this, we do the, the additional uh, PCR step to get a lot of linear product based on the assembly product. And then phosphorylation, ligation and transformation. So yeah, one question was like, um, are you getting backbone from the initial PCR in the um, clones that they grow at, 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 at the end with uh, in lactobacillus? So um, uh, I repeated the, the, the whole product, adding the DPN1 digestion. DPN1 is one enzyme that digests uh, methylated DNA. So the, the template that we use for the PCR comes from a plasmid, which is uh, methylated because E. coli methylates the DNA. And then um, I ran in parallel both um, protocols, one with DPN1 digestion, one without. And we could see that the transformation efficiency is the same. 
because as we suspected like these tiny amounts of template that you use for the PCR, initial PCR, this gets lost after all the purification steps, all the Gibson assembly ligation, um, pull, well, all these steps, like yeah, they dilute a lot the, the, the initial backbone. So that was not a problem. But it meant that um, the reviewer really understood the protocol and, and all these steps. And, and that was a very nice uh, feedback, I think. And why did yeah, we, we decide the... to make... Sorry, no, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, we, we got a couple of really good points like this. And even though we speculated, uh, you know, how it would go, I think there was a lot of value in actually following through testing and, and you know, validating whether one thing works or not. And every enzyme like DPN1 that you add is, is time and money, of course. Uh, and if, you know, often you're doing an experiment, something doesn't work, you start suspecting if it's one thing or the other. Uh, so it was good that, yeah, we, we have this information also out there because of the reviewer's comments. And why did you decide to make the, the peer review history public together with your paper? Well, I think it's, um, I, I really, this is the first time actually I've had, uh, I, I've come, come across this, this model of having the peer review public. And uh, for me, always science is supposed to be an open thing. And I guess I think the whole world is moving in that direction in any case. So when I saw that option, I think there was there was no doubt about it. Um, and I think, yeah, the co-authors also agreed to this basically. So I think it's just the philosophy of science having to be open. Uh, and uh, And the review was good. And I felt our responses to the review was good. And there was value in that just as much as we've explained right now. So we are happy to have it out there uh, in public. Thank you. And um, I would like us now to move a little bit more uh, deeper or deeper into the protocol itself. And I don't know if you can share what do you think are the most critical steps for the protocol to be successful? And if you could share this information with the users. Yeah, I think I can answer Mark, that. I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for sure, it's the PCR. Uh, the PCR that uh, will amplify the assembled product, that's the critical one, because um, the rest of the steps are based on standard protocols and kits that they work super well at the Gibson assembly kit, phosphorylation kit, ligation kit, DNA purification kit. So all these, they work very well. Uh, the, the PCR is the critical because um, it has to work. It has to work to amplify a lot of DNA. So you can circularize this DNA and then you have circular DNA that you can transform in, in the uh, in lactobacillus. If the PCI is messy um, or it doesn't work, then no chance that that uh, you'll get the, the, the protocol like um, it will be successful. And then um, for the PCR to work, um, it also depends a lot on the size of the plasmid. Like at the beginning, for instance, um, well, I was starting the PhD, so we don't have a lot of genetic parts to clone in the plasmid. It was mainly the antibiotic resistance, the origin and the gene of interest. Now, um, thankfully, we have other parts working, so um, we have to insert more and more parts in the plasmid, which makes the plasmid bigger. And this can be a disadvantage because sometimes this PCR is tricky. Like um, lately, we've been facing issues with uh, plasmid that is 8, 9 kb. Um, and yeah, we kind of fix it. So we know that um, purifying, for instance, the Gibson assembly, well, the Hi-Fi or Gibson assembly um, reaction, uh, prior to the PCR helps because for sure in the in the high fat reaction you have several enzymes and buffer and so on so if you get rid of those you have the assembled product more pure and then you use this as template this works better of course it that's another step but um, some some challenges that uh, yeah like arise and and well we we've been trying to like fix them like this like troubleshooting and and yeah trying out and it's good that now more people are doing it because you know like uh, there are different kind of backbones and and genes cloning there one comes from one bacteria the other is like human gene you know so um it's good to to have more people working so we have more experience all of us and we also had um, uh, one aspect that was crucial was the the amount of dna used for transformation 
at the end. So you had even a whole table of, of different amounts of DNA, right, Mark? And uh, yeah. you found like uh, about one microgram was probably the best or so. Yeah, this was kind of reported that the more DNA you transform, the more transformants you'll get. Um, but normally we stick to one microgram, which is easily achieved in this protocol. Um, but yeah, like lower amounts like will decrease the transformation efficiency, but this is expected. Yeah. And I actually wanted us to discuss troubleshooting. And you, Mark, have already mentioned that as the plasmid grows, you know, it, it becomes more complicated to handle. And purifying it's something that you can do uh, to increase efficiency. Are there only are there any other steps that you have discovered since the time of publication that can be either troubleshooted or or further optimized? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Right now, if I need to start a cloning from scratch, normally the insert that I'm cloning the vector comes from a synthetic gene. Because like this, I'm not using a backbone. So this PCR, well, I don't need to PCR it because I directly add the overhangs for the Gibson assembly in the synthetic gene. So I don't PCR this. I take directly this um, along with the PCR of the backbone in the um, Gibson assembly reaction. So then what I do, um, if the insert is... It, it must be only promoter, for instance, coding sequence and terminator. Then you need to design the primer somewhere there. And you need the whole thing to be like mutation free because the promoter, you cannot miss any base, the coding sequence, you cannot miss any base and terminator too. Thing is terminate, um, terminators, for instance, they have this structure um, they form these harpins. So it's tricky to design primers there. Coding sequence, you never know. This uh, gene might be from humans, so it might be like risky also, or like challenging to find primers that are suitable or that they can potentially work well in the coding sequence. And the promoter also, it's very 80, 80 rich. So this makes it uh, an issue also for the PCR because the annealing temperature is low and so on. Maybe not, it's not compatible with the polymerase and so on. So what I do is like I add some junk DNA in the insert, like upstream or downstream um, the terminator or the promoter and that part like is like um only for the primer design so i have some part that the junk dna i designed there the primers that will cover the whole plasmid and then if some mutation arises there it won't affect the gene but this involves planning um, because you need to design the, the synthetic gene from scratch and then use this so now that i have way more experience with cloning and uh, I've cloned many things. Um, I, I that's what I do. I always keep the same. It's kind of a signature. I use the same back um, junk DNA there. I have the same um, primer set that works very well. At the beginning, I designed like couple, and well, both primer set works well. Uh, and yeah, I use the same for 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 all. And now that we have discussed, you know, uh, critical steps and troubleshooting, I would like us. Uh, to take a step back and I don't know if you can share with us what has been the significance of publishing this peer-reviewed paper for both of your careers at different stages, right? Uh, a, a junior independent researcher and a PhD student. Yeah, I think um, the this puts us on the map of lactobacillus engineering, basically. So we are a very young group. There have been people who are still around who have been working on this for two three decades uh, and they've done incredible good incredible work which is the foundation on which we actually started because of which we could act at all start because there are challenges that we just had to figure out from the literature um, but yeah we are completely new on the map uh, in the end and so this protocol basically kind of allowed us to say that Hi, we're here, we understand the challenges and we want to contribute to helping this community, you know, grow. And um, the protocol itself, plus one is, is great. It, it gives us uh, quite a good amount of visibility. Uh, Protocols.io is a very easy platform where we, in which with which we can share the protocol. So we've done that with, with many people in the community now. Um, and yeah, these kind of initiatives that you have now with this video call, for example, uh, is is really amazing. Um, and this is like a staple in every conference presentation that I have, for example, now. So this is the starting of 
my slides usually uh, when I start talking about the research to say that, yeah, this is the, this is the biggest or this is the starting roadblock in engineering this bacteria. And here we've got a solution for anyone who wants to try to, you know, try to get into this field also or who wants to improve what they're doing, uh, for example. And uh, yeah, just uh, like three weeks ago, we were at a lactic acid bacteria conference in the Netherlands, which is a massive conference with like about 600 people from, you know, like the, the pioneers of the field and so on. And it was an amazing experience to actually be there and talk about this on stage in front of everyone and see that it got appreciated and people finding that there was value in this being out there it was it was a little bit scary of course you know these are like the the big dogs in the in the field and if they think like ah yeah we're doing this in our lab every day you know why, why did you want to publish this but uh no the the response was actually very positive and very good uh and it, it's such a nice feeling we have the qr code on the slide for example and always point to it and say you know the protocol's out there everything's open just just follow it if you have any problems contact us uh and yeah so i think i i i i don't think i can necessarily uh kind of visualize the impact right at the moment but i feel in talking to people that there is an impact for the career uh in say showing that we are on the map of of engineering left of so well that is at least for me uh, i guess for mark it's it's probably uh, a slightly different experience and for me, it was first like uh, very good to see how an idea can be translated into a protocol and a publication. And also this paper is very different to a normal research article. Like normally, um, because this is mostly like about a protocol that we, we did some demonstrations to like make it a research article. But uh, the way we write it and the way like, um, well, it's done and structure is different to like all the papers I've been involved. So it was also very good to like be um well participate in in, in in this kind of publication and yeah it's right now it's super useful i don't know what i would many clones that i've done no chance i would be able to do have done it without any this um without this protocol like uh sticking to e coli or then like maybe i guess i will we have moved to like lactis uh but then this is more time consuming you need to um be working with three bacteria at the same time and making competent cells and so on. Like um, I prefer to just like focus on one. I, at, at the beginning, like my PhD was mainly focused on E. coli and lactobacillus. Thanks to this protocol, I can do everything in lactobacillus and I stick to one bacteria. And for me, it simplifies a lot the my life. So yeah, it is, I'm, I'm happy with this. It's great to hear how both the protocol itself and the process of getting it published and the paper have positively impacted your careers. and. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to mention that we haven't discussed so far? Well, we tested this uh, protocol with other bacteria, so not only Lactobacillus plantarum. Uh, we also tested for Lactococcus lactis and Bacillus subtilis, and it also works. So, like, uh, like this is not limited to Lactobacilli. Like people working with all the bacteria that are hard to transform, they can give it a try because. Potentially, it must work as long as the that host accepts unmethylated DNA. This is one of the inconveniences of this of this protocol that it's based on a PCR amplification. Therefore, the eventual product is not methylated, so the host must accept unmethylated DNA, and then it, it it should work. But yeah, we tested for these two bacteria that they are the ones that we had in the lab as well, and it works very well for Bacillus lactococcus. So yeah, like everyone who has like difficulties like transforming. Uh, DNA into hard to transform bacteria, they can give it a try for sure. I have to confess that I've learned a lot about molecular biology techniques just by having this conversation. Uh, uh, and you three, any, anything that you would like to add or we're good? I, I think, yeah, I, I think we've, we've actually conveyed the, the message really well uh, so far. Um, we're just very happy with the protocol. We're happy that it got published and uh, we're really happy with the experience of protocols at IO to systematically describe it uh, in steps. Yeah, the site is very user-friendly. Um, once you're familiar with it, it's extremely intuitive. And yeah, I was, I mean, I thought it would take, because she just uh, asked me like, uh, you should write a protocol in, in this site, you know, it will help a lot. And I was like, oh, I mean, 
I was like uh, working revisions and so on. It's like uh, this might take a lot of time, but no, eventually it took two, three hours. And and I think it's very useful for people because I could add some comments there that, as I said before, you cannot add in the in the manuscript or in the publication. Um, so yeah, I hope that it makes life easier for people who wanna who wanna try it. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you so much for the interview, for practicing open science. And uh, I think that with that, um, we will sell farewell. Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, yeah, see you. Bye. See you.